Well, welcome to the herb. Let's see. Well, welcome to the Botanical Medicine Study Course with me, your host and instructor for the course, Stephanie Georgiev. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with me. And if you would like a free introductory lesson and handouts, please click on the link below, answer a few questions, and you will be guided on how to be the first on your block to get this wonderful material. Well, here we are in mid-June already. Just think six months till Christmas. So it's time to start planning now. But in the meantime, here in southwestern Bulgaria, it is rose season in the incredible Valley of the Roses and actually all over the country. It's just so wonderful uh, going into town and uh, throughout the villages and everybody's got some sort of rose bush on a trellis or something. It's, it's really beautiful. Now, according to tropical astrology, the birth flower of June is two flowers, obviously for the Gemini twin nature of the sign of the Zodiac. The flowers are rose and honeysuckle, which I think could not be more different on every level, but that's very Geminian. Most of the literature considers rose as the flower of June. And because my birthday is in June, I prefer to receive roses instead of honeysuckles as a gift. So for this second herb of the week for June, we're going to explore this beautiful gift of nature, rose, for its healing properties. Shakespeare's favorite flower was the rose. He mentions roses over 70 times throughout his poems, sonnets, and plays, more than any other flower. Rose's conventional positive association with love, beauty, and sweetness are familiar to us all, and they almost border on cliche. Shakespeare also used the rose to convey the painful side of love and the passing of time. In Juliet's Lament on Lo Love, the rose is a metaphor for the darker aspect of this emotion. Is love a tender thing? It's too rough, too rude, too boisterous. It pricks like a thorn. For me, roses are the epitome of a beautiful flower, and I love every kind, every col color, cultivated and wild. A rose is either a woody perennial flower, flowering plant of the genus Rosa in the family Rosaceae, or the flower it bears. Now the family, the Latin name for the family, Rosaceae, sort of sounds like a skin condition. So maybe make sure when you're Googling this, you ask for the plant family. Now there are three, there are over 300 species and tens of thousands of cultivated ones. Their flowers vary in size and shape and are usually large and showy in colors ranging from white through yellows and reds and blues and pinks and everything you can imagine. Most species are native to Asia with smaller native species in Europe, North America, and Northwestern Africa. The birthplace of the cultivated rose was probably Persia on the Caspian Sea or the Gulf of Persia. Fossil records indicate that Rosa species have existed on the planet for at least 40 million years. The earliest historical records that are found on Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets indicate that the rose became known to humans about 5,000 years ago. A clay tablet of Sargon I, which I think is an incredible name, uh, and he was king of Acadia, uh, and that ancient empire was in the area of Mesopotamia, which is kind of in the area of, of the Middle East, or Saudi Arabia, etc. And this was in 2684 through 2630 BCE. This was when Sargon I ruled 
uh, it records that he brought rose saplings during his military campaign to the countries across the Tigris River. So instead of putting landmines, he put rose bushes, which I think was, was really very tasteful. Because he formerly lived in the ancient city of Ur near Babylon, his trip was most probably in southeastern Anatolia, which is now considered present-day Turkey. From there, the rose spread across Mesopotamia to Palestine and across Asia Minor to Greece. And the Greeks brought it to the Italian peninsula. And it's apparent that the Romans took cultivating of roses quite seriously. And, you know, because all things, everything about this peninsula, I find absolutely fascinating. Things are brought there and the, the people living there just do wonderful things uh, with everything, food, art, architecture, you name it. And uh, these ancient Romans uh, created deep, beautiful, deep red cultivars, which we now associate with roses. And the Romans used them to decorate their banquets, flavored their food, food and wine with rose petals. And I'm sure rose petals and oil were used in many an orgy. Now, the rosaceae, the rose family, not the skin condition, is a medium-sized family of flowering plant that includes 4,828 known species and is in 91 genre. And I feel for the uh, botany counting committee, they've got a, quite a job. This family includes much of the world's most important economic plants, including various edible fruits, such as apples, pears, quinces, apricots, plums, cherries, peaches, raspberries, blackberries, loquats, strawberries, rose hips, hawthorns, and almonds. And I will leave it up to your imagination what kind of delicious food you can make by combining all of these things. The family also includes popular ornamental trees and shrubs, such as roses, hawthorns, meadow sweets, rowans, fire thorns, and something, I have no idea what it is, it's called phytonias, but those in the know, you can send me a link in the program notes as to what the heck that is. Now, the key to identifying any plant in the rose family is the signature five petal flower and the formation of a droop or fruit. And a droop fruit is like uh, cherry and apricot, um, apple, actually. It's basically the hip of the flower that when the petals fall off, forms these wonderful fruits. And also the hips, obviously, such as hawthorn berries and rose hips. So that's how you can identify these amazing plants from this family that's not a skin condition. Now, the three main roses used medicinally are the damask rose, the cabbage rose, and the tea rose. And I have the Latin underneath there. I won't bore you or make you cringe with my attempts at pronouncing them. And I am struck by how similar the damask and the cabbage rose look. And actually, to me, they almost look like um, camellias, but they are roses. Now, the main ways that roses are applied medicinally are through the essential oil of rose, which Anybody who either sells or purchases this incredible oil is very expensive. We're talking really expensive. Like this little bottle in on the slide probably is worth about $250. And But keep in mind, and here again, we think the people that count things, it takes approximately two. 152,000 individual petals, and I'm curious who counted all of that, 
or 8,000 rose flowers to produce five milliliters or one teaspoon of rose oil. And this is equivalent to 42 pounds or approximately 20 plus kilos of rose petals. Now rose infused oil is made from placing rose petals into an oil such as almond or grapeseed oil. And you uh, let the petals steep in that for a couple of weeks and then you take them out. And this oil is not so expensive and is wonderful for things like massages. Now, the other way that it's applied medicinally is through rose water, which is the byproduct of making the essential oil. It's also called a hydrosol. You can also make rose water by, you know, using like a, a very weak tea and preserving it in alcohol. Um, Rose water is lovely to use as a spritz or a bath. It's wonderful. It's a really wonderful for the skin. Any kind of skin problem you can possibly think of is helped by rose. And there is a tea, obviously, that you can make from fresh or dried petals. You can also make pastes from the fresh petals and use it as a poultice. And the other very common and healing part of the rose is the rose hips. They sort of look like cherry tomatoes in the, the slide. And these are delicious to eat fresh off the bush or use them dried in tinctures, syrups, honeys, and something called an oxymel, which we will talk about later in the program. Now, the medicinal actions of roses are mainly mainly due from the petals due to the scent and the uh, rose hips due to the high levels of antioxidants. So the scent and also the chemicals in the rose petals have a sedative effect on the nervous system. They're also analgesic and anti-inflammatory and analgesic basically means pain reliever. There are some studies out there that say rose helps to prevent dementia, which I think is interesting. Uh, it's anti-convulsive. Um, the rose petals uh, help to relieve coughs. It, this lovely plant nourishes the heart. It has antimicrobial properties, and it also has antioxidant properties, especially in the rose hips. Now, the rose hips have the most bioavailable vitamin C on the planet, okay? In fact, I personally think it's the best form of taking over-the-counter vitamin C supplements because I personally find that it's not as acidic as synthetic vitamin C. I seem to be very sensitive to that. And if I take uh, ascorbic acid, my tummy hurts and my gums are very sensitive and my tongue hurts. But it doesn't happen when I use um, rose hips. Now, the vitamin C in rose hips enhances other forms of vitamin C present in fruits and vegetables and transforms them into something bigger, better, and more usable by your body. Now, vitamin C in rose hips is instrumental in breaking up viral debris that can accumulate in the heart valves, causing things like heart palpitations, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and arrhythmia. Rose hips are also amazing for helping to relieve urinary tract infections and healing skin conditions. And the rose hips mostly used in the West are from what's called Rosa canina, canina which is the dog rose. <clears throat> now, in addition to being very high in vitamin C, rose hips also have a higher ratio of antioxidants than most healing foods, which is particularly important for anyone dealing with chronic diseases or wanting to prevent disease as well as things like allergies. And you can make this wonderful remedy, which for the first time I ever made it or even heard of it was when I was living in Minnesota a few years ago. And I was doing this during 
the pandemic and it's called an oxymel, which is a very thick syrup and it's almost bordering on preserves, um, the, the, te- the consistency. And it's made from honey and apple cider vinegar. And you can make this amazing elixir with rose hips. And if you do, let's say you have a, a very prolific rose bush and you harvest all of your rose hips, um, you can make yourself an oxymel and you will have a very delicious and very healthy winter health tonic, taking a tablespoon of this per day. And what I did was I made it with rose hips and I also put in um, some elderberries and that was a delicious daily shot of wellness. And I did not catch the pandemic And this was in the days before the vaccine was available. So it was really good to do. Now, like most aromatic plants used in perfumery, rose has been analyzed quite vociferously. And in this slide, you can see there are legions of healing substances in the rose hips. Now, uh, in the rose petals, A major aspect of that is something called an aldehyde, which is uh, a wonderful uh, constituent that is very aromatic. We find the aldehydes in most of our essential oils, particularly the flowers, but this is very, has a wonderful affinity for the nervous system and it's very calming. Um, And so there's more aldehydes in the petals and more flavonoids in the hips. And I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce this. And you're welcome to use any of this in your Scrabble game. Now, the traditional Chinese medicine use of rose is the rose bud, and it's referred to as mei gui hua. And hua is the Chinese term for flower. And this flower is part of the Rosaceae family and has been used as an herb in formulas for thousands of years. The rosebud is dried and used in tea for various health conditions. It's warm, it's bitter and sweet, it enters the liver and spleen meridians, and it's part of the category of herbs that regulate Chi, and the Chinese use this in various uh, formulas for abdominal pain, loss of appetite, vomiting, irregular menstruation, and depression. And the um, Rosa rugosa is the type of uh, flower that is used in traditional Chinese medicine. And the flowers they use to regulate the liver and spleen meridians, and they use the hips to tonify the kidney, spleen, and lung meridians. Now, during to due to its astringent properties, it's very good for diarrhea. Now, the rose has traditionally been used in Ayurveda for thousands of years to soothe the mind, hearts, and emotions. And its soothing scent and moisturizing oils and medicinal properties make it a multi-purpose treasure for uplifting the heart and the whole body. And it's called gulab. And apologies for my Hindi. And it's, I think these are fun terms. This is what the Ayurvedic texts say. It's light, slimy, bitter, astringent, sweet, and cold. And it's called Rosa Indica Lin, or the Indian Cabbage Rose. Now, in Ayurvedic uh, medicine, India's 5,000-year-old traditional medicine, rose is considered to be balancing to all three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. And for those of you who want to know your dosha, there's various quizzes online where you can be told what you are. 
And um, the gulab or rose strengthens the heart, it aids digestion, it calms the nerves, and it also helps people sleep. It's really good for respiratory congestion, and it's also good for soothing anger and irritability, and if you're very critical. So if you go to an Ayurvedic practitioner and you're being spritzed with rose flower water, take that as a hint. Now, it's also good for inflammation that can manifest as redness, uh, sensitivity or blemishes on the skin surfaceness. And it's good for nervousness, anxiety, fatigue, and worry. And rose water and tea are the most common usages in Ayurveda. And most of the prescriptions are to spray your pillows with rose water before you sleep which I think is just delightful. And they also use a paste made of rose petals and apply this to wounds to speed up healing. Now, the uh, use of rose um, by the Arabs is just very ancient. And we find on Assyrian tablets uh, these cuneiform uh, clay tablets, they talk of rose and rose water. They don't tell you what genus and cultivar they are because that hadn't been uh, invented yet. This was invented more in our day. Um, but because they keep talking about how wonderful everything smells, they're probably talking about the Galatia or Centifolia or Moshata or Damascus forms of the rose. And that's of the Anatolia region, which is in what's considered now modern day Turkey. Now these cuneiform texts also indicate that the roses were not directly distilled, but they were boiled with water to produce fragrant water. And very small quantities of rose and rose water were prescribed. And this shows how precious these flowers were considered. Now, something I find really fascinating is that the rose is one of the most important symbols used by the Oriental Muslim poets. And we have a beautiful quote here by Rumi. Rose is sent to earth by the gardeners of paradise for empowering the mind and the eye of the spirit. I mean, wow. And um, the, there was a wonderful symbol, uh, very important to mystical Muslim traditions known as Sufism and also the Bektashi tradition. The exquisite beauty and purity of rose flowers placed on a thorny branch rooted in the earth symbolizes the mystical path to Allah, which I just think is really lovely. Now, each year during the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, known as the Hajj, the black cloth of Kabaz, which is the holiest shrine in Islam, and located at the mosque in Mecca, is sprinkled with rose water from Iran or Turkey, and rose oil is burnt in the Kaaba's oil lamp. And the three rose-derived drug products most prominently discussed in ancient Islamic medical texts are rose water, distilled water of roses, rose confection or rose paste, a thick jam produced by blending roses with sugar or honey, and I often wonder if modern variations on Turkish delight isn't kind of a, an echo of this. And rose oil, which is made steeping in roses and sesame seed or olive oil and left in the sun. And ancient Arab physicians used rose products for stomach pains, ulcers, livers, and mouth diseases and sore throats. They would also use them for burns, ulcerated wounds, and something I think is very interesting is an ingredient for hemorrhoid salve, which I think is so much more delightful than preparation age, but um, it's really widely used and widely documented in ancient texts. 
Now here in Bulgaria, where I'm living at present, the fertile lands are most well known for the roses. And Bulgarian rose is some of the finest in the world. And there's even a Valley of the Roses in central Bulgaria that has a rose festival with a rose queen and all kinds of things. Now, I personally like the taste of flowers, such as lavender, rose, nasturtium, calendula, and violet. But then I'm an herbalist, so we tend to like interesting tastes. So you may not like these. And before you invest in expensive rose products for making rose tasting things, I think you should sample things and see if you do like it. Sometimes people think it tastes like soap. I don't. I think it tastes like rose, but that's me. And here in Bulgaria, one of the most delightful discoveries I had when I started becoming familiar with the grocery store chains was that you can buy things like rose jam, rose syrup, rose juice, and obviously the dry, dried petals. The first time I ever ate anything rose flavored was when I was at UCLA as an undergrad and there was a gelato place that opened up near my apartment a few months before I left. And it was a good thing that I was leaving and had very little money, or I would have spent a lot of time at this place at the expense of my thighs. But any in any case, I first tried rose gelato there and I was hooked. Now there's a chain, a vegan food chain in California, kind of like a fast food type of restaurant and they have a rose cardamom muffin that is to die for and I like to add rose extract to my shortbread recipes and other baked goods and I really like the combination of rose and chocolate and so I like putting that in my chocolate truffles and it's also quite yummy to add rose flavor to things like pistachio baklava. Now I use either rose water, which you can get at Arab and Indian markets or rose extract, which I've never seen in most market. I've never seen it even here in Bulgaria. I've not seen it, but it's easily ordered online and it's probably at high end um, food uh, specialty food stores, but you can get it online or you can make some yourself. I've got a link in the program notes on how to do that. And again, not everybody likes the flavor, but I do. And I really like the rose juice I get here in Bulgaria. And many cuisines use rose water, such as Persian, Turkish, and Indian in all sorts of dishes. So there's rose infused beverages like lemonades, juices, iced tea, hot tea, rose simple syrup that you can pour over things. Um, you can also use it as a base for a cocktail or in a lemonade. Uh, you can flavor your sugar with rose petals. Uh, you can make candied flower petals and place them on top of things and imp impress your friends and neighbors uh, you can also put rose petals in ice cube trays and uh, freeze some water uh, with the rose petal inside. It's really decorative and I think really sweet tasting. You can put rose petals in your salads. Um, you can put dried rose petals in granola. You can make butter, rose butter, and obviously use rose water and sprinkle it over things that you would like. And I've got a couple of links in the program notes on how to cook with roses. Now, growing up in Southern California meant the annual rose parade from Pasadena. And at the Huntington Gardens, which are at the in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains above Pasadena, there were amazing rose gardens and April was always the best time to visit. Now, roses are a wonderful addition to your gardens and can be, you don't need to say, oh, I don't have a place to grow. You can grow them in pots and you can have them on trellises. I'm seeing a lot of that here in Bulgaria. It's really fun. Um, I'm hoping to get some sort of trellis going here at uh, the house where I'm living. 
And they're also good and wonderfully designated gardens. Like we're gonna have our rose gardens here. Now, roses flower in summer uh, with many repeat flowerings into the autumn. And that means you can also gather your rose hips. They last for many years. They love sun. And like most plants, they like a rich, moist, well-drained soil. And it's a really good idea to prune them uh, once a year. And I usually recommend and like to do this in the uh, late autumn before the first frosts. And if you want to boost flowering, you just pick off the head and more burst out there. And one of the best ways to make new plants is by cuttings. And my grandmother, who was born in this part of the world, anytime we went anywhere, I mean anywhere, the woman had no shame. She would snap off a, a, a branch of a rose bush and we would go home in the car with her, you know, holding this with a wet paper towel on the bottom and she would put it in water and it would start to root and then she would transplant it and then you would have this amazing rose bush. So however you want to incorporate this most delightful flower that has charmed thousands of years of humans in your garden, in your bath, or through delicious goodies from your kitchen, I hope you enjoy this amazing gift from nature, the rose. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with me. Again, there are many links in the program notes for things that I've discussed throughout this video. And also, if you want a free introductory lesson, a video and handouts, just click that link. And until next time, be well.